Good morning. We want to welcome everybody here in person. Glad you made it. And we want to welcome all those who are viewing online as well. This morning we are going to start with two songs and we decided to do something different today. We wanted to do a couple of scripture songs. So the first one, if you want to turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 25, it's unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. And it kind of loosely follows along with verses 1 through 7. So sing along with us. <clears throat> Okay, all right. No intro. Unto, unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Unto thee, O Lord. I don't know if I got the starting note right. Sorry, guys. We had no practice ahead of time, so this is on the fly. Sorry. All right. Go ahead. Un, unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in thee. And thee not be ashamed not mine enemies triumph over me. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. O oh my God, I trust in thee, let me not be ashamed, let not mine enemies triumph over me. I think we'll stop there because that's really low for me. <laughs> okay, now do we have time for one more? I think so, let's do... I think everyone probably knows this one. He has shown thee, O oh man, what is good, and it's Micah 6, 8. He has shown the old man what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. One more time. He has shown the old man what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. All right, thank you. Good morning, happy Sabbath. Good morning. Um, hmm. This morning I'm going to have prayer. And I was just reminded this week of really how powerful, let's try again, how powerful prayer can be. Um, in many ways, but one that stuck, st I can't talk today, maybe I shouldn't be praying. Um, one that stood out yesterday was just a friend that needed some prayers for um, just feeling down, you know, things had just gotten the better of them. And I was in the middle of working, and they texted and said, hey, can you pray for me? And I thought, okay, yeah. And so I put everything away, well, aside. And I said a prayer for them, and they called later to say that shortly after that prayer, they really felt just this sense of joy that had come over them. And it just, um, there were several things like this, like that this last week, 
But it just goes to show us that we really don't understand how powerful prayer can be sometimes. Yeah. And I think of like all of the many families that have lost loved ones from the bombing this week. And I think of people that are here, people that are watching, that have their own struggles, whether they are financial, emotional, um, health struggles, whatever those may be, that God really, like bringing these prayers, these problems, these joys to God, so much can be done because we're asking him to be a part of our lives and other people's lives. So this morning I just want to um, remind us all of that and just praise God for the God that he is. So if you can bow your heads with me. Dear God, we are here this morning just thankful. Thankful for another day of life. Thankful for breath in our lungs. Thankful that we can be with our family members that are here, our friends that are here. God, there are people that are just watching that have no one with them, Lord, but they are alive today. Their heart is still beating. And we think, Lord, of the many families that lost loved ones this week. And we just pray, Lord, that you would be close to them, Lord that you would comfort them, that they would feel your presence, that they would know that you care for them just as much as the robin and the bird and the animals, Lord, that we are important to you. God, we have so many things to be thankful for. The sun is shining today. It's warm outside. Um, for most of us, we had breakfast. And for those of us that didn't, it was by choice. And so, Lord, there are many that, that don't have that opportunity, but we just praise you that we live in a place that really gives us um, all, that all of our needs are met, Lord. And God, I just pray this morning that we would understand the power of prayer more deeply, that we would know and feel confident when we pray to you that you are a God that answers our prayers, Lord. And sometimes our prayers are answered in a time that is more your perfect timing, and we don't understand it. But I just pray that we would um, continue to have faith even when our prayers aren't answered right away. Lord, we thank you for loving us. We ask that you would come close to us just now. We ask for your presence to be to fill this church, Lord, and the sanctuary, that each person would feel you right next to them, God. And Lord, that those that are watching, that your presence would feel fill their homes as well, God, or their spaces, that they would also feel you. Lord, we want to pray a blessing on Pastor Will as he brings the message today. We ask that you would um, just speak through him, Lord. Help us to hear what you are speaking to us. And we just thank you for the Sabbath day, a day that we can come away from the busyness of life, a day where we can spend it with you, with friends, and really um, deepen our relationship with you, Lord. We thank you for this day. We ask and pray that you would answer each prayer that is silently spoken here and through the internet, Lord, and we just thank you for your love for us. Amen. Amen. Today's scripture reading is found in Luke 11, verses 5 through 8. And he said to them, Which of you shall have a friend, and go to him at midnight, and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence he will rise and give him as many as he needs. Thank you for the music. You know, it's not always that we sing scripture. But I can imagine if David were here, he would lead us even with his harp. <laughs> because David used to um, sing most of the psalms that we find recorded. We miss out on that because we're not living at the time of David. And as a matter of fact, you know, uh, in our evening uh, devotional that Judy and I are doing, we are right now in the book of First. Um, Samuel, and we're reading about how David was hiding in En Gedi, and uh, how Saul was pursuing him, and sent thousands of men to try and snuff him out, and David came while Saul was sitting in the cave, and he cut off a piece of his garment, and showed it to him, and said, you know, I could have killed you, but I saved your life, <laughs> and I thought to myself, wow, you know, 
What an experience. We learn a lot when we read the Bible. Today, uh, Heather also said that, you know, our, our hearts are really aching for the 13 families that uh, were impacted by that terrible bomb blast in Kabul airport on Thursday. You know, when you, when you look at those young people in their 20s, um, one which is a father-to-be in three weeks' time, um, you know, it's, it's heartbreaking. And um, I remember the article I read, it said at the time when September 11 attacks happened, uh, many of those were babies. And uh, now they're longer there. So uh, we, we, we pray for those families. We pray for our men and women in the military. And we pray for the decisions that politicians are making that impact our people on the ground. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's hard because, you know, it's, uh, it's understandable that people are angry at times, and, and we know. But we're also thinking today about people in the path of that terrible hurricane that's churning up um, towards Louisiana, and uh, it's expected to make landfall tomorrow afternoon. And we want to just remind the folk there in Louisiana and, um, and Mississippi and those areas uh, that were impacted in 2000 and was it 2005 when Hurricane Katrina hit there? I believe it was an exact the same date about that, um, that they are looking at this approaching hurricane. So um, let's pray for those people there also. And also those of you who are watching us, I, I know my daughter sent me a text this morning and she said to me, Dad, I'm looking forward to follow the message today from Lake Lake in England where she is. So Nadia, I'm glad that you're with us and uh, may God bless you where you are and hope that you're all doing well with the Brits and enjoying tea and uh, I know it's afternoon in England right now so it's time for cream tea. You know they order a cream tea in England. She tells me you walk into a place and on the menu they have an item called cream tea and uh, what it is is you get your pot of tea with your scone with cream and strawberry jam. That's a cream tea, so it comes as a menu item. Now you know why I can't wait to go to England to visit. We are continuing our study in the Gospel of Luke. And you know, the more I look and study and delve into the way this person, who was a medical doctor, he wasn't one of the disciples, but he did accompany the Apostle Paul, on these missionary journeys. And we know that he is also the author of the book of Acts, and uh, he describes the early development of the Christian church and how the message was spreading and how God's um, people were just working to continue the work that Jesus started. But what I like about Luke is Luke would sometimes take what Jesus said and he will highlight something that we don't always observe at face value. You sometimes have to go around. You know, the Germans have a word for this, and they call it Anverfremdungstechnik. And what that is, is you don't always have to just read it as issue. Sometimes you have to pause and ask yourself, okay, what is Jesus trying to teach us here? One of the examples is when you go to just a previous chapter of Luke in chapter 10, where Jesus was sharing the parable of the Good Samaritan. And the parable was shared in answer to a person who came and said, Lord, who is my neighbor? That was a question. Who is my neighbor? The discussion was about you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and you should love your neighbor as yourself. So this person came and said, who is my neighbor? And after Jesus shared the story of the Good Samaritan, he came in Luke chapter 10 and verse 36. After sharing how that man that was left for dead next to the road, how the priest came by, and the Levite came by, and then the Samaritan appeared on his donkey, and he helped the man. And then Jesus replied, and he said in Luke chapter 10, verse 36, So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? 
You see how Jesus changed that? He didn't say, okay, now, who do you think is your neighbor? He says, who do you think was the neighbor to the wounded man? So Jesus places a certain twist on what we would just assume to be the logical outcome. And that is why when we look at the parable that Anna shared with us in our scripture this morning, we find something remarkable in there because the question should be asked, what is Jesus trying to teach us here about God, about prayer, about himself? Heather mentioned to you how important prayer is and what an integral part of our experience prayer is. How we pray daily, we pray for our loved ones and when you're a parent, you know what I mean when I tell you our children keep us on our knees. And Jesus would not have given a parable if it was not designed to teach us something about God. Now, when you look at the context, in Luke chapter 11, Jesus had just replied to a question that came to him by the disciples when they came and said to him in verse 1, Lord, teach us to pray. And of course, he told them and instructed them. And we know, we all know that our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And when Jesus concluded this teaching about prayer, he said to them, which of you shall have a friend? And go to midnight. And then, of course, follows the parable. So, it's obvious that Jesus was tying this in with a teaching and just giving them about prayer. But then we also have a story that follows this parable. And Jesus uses here the metaphor of a father and a son in an experience. And he says, so I say to you in verse 9 of Luke chapter 11, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, you will find Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives, and he who seeks, finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. And then in verse 11, here's the metaphor. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, Will he offer him a scorpion? And then the reply comes in verse 13. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So Jesus was not here explaining so much the love relationship between the Son and the Father. What he was trying to teach us was the integrity on the part of the Father, there was a willingness in the heart of the father to give the son anything that he was asking for and even perhaps more. So it shows about there was this characteristic about the father that was willing to give. He was going to honor the request of the son when he came asking for breakfast. I want an egg. And dad says, sorry, you can have a scorpion. No, nothing of that. God is not like that. So now we have to understand with the teaching of the model prayer in the first part of the chapter and the metaphor of the father and son explaining something in the heart of the father that is going to react a certain way to the request of the son, we find embedded in between this parable of the friend who came at midnight. Now, we always read this parable and we interpret it as Jesus saying, well, you just need to be persistent in prayer, right? You just have to go and be persistent. And that is what the word here is in the Bible. When you read with me in Luke chapter 11, look at verse 8. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend. Important, remember that. Yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as Many as he needs. But why would Jesus teach here a parable about persistence? If in Luke chapter 18, 
He will remind the disciples that one should always pray and not lose heart and then continues to explain the parable in prayer about the woman with the unjust judge who came and she was persistently asking the judge to perform justice unto her. Why would Jesus do a repeat? Luke and Jesus are not emphasizing persistence here. So what do we do when we try to find out what Jesus was trying to say? You go to the original text. And you look and you find, what is the word? And there's a very interesting word in the Greek. It's the word here that is used to describe this persistence with. It's the word anaidian. Now, we are not Greek scholars. But I want to just share with you the importance of how a word can sometimes change the meaning or the understanding we have of Scripture. To give an example, when Jesus in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, talks about God has reconciled himself to the world through Jesus, the word for reconciliation, what does it mean to be reconciled? Some people say, well, it's when you bring two parties together. Well, it means when you breach the gap. Well, in the Greek, the word katalegain for reconciliation means to restore someone in favor with. So when we are reconciled to God, sin has separated us from God, and God is hurting because of what sin is doing to his created children. So when Jesus came and died on the cross and is reconciling us to God, he's restoring us in favor with God. No wonder Jesus says there's joy in heaven because when one sinner repents. Just the correct understanding of a word paints a total different picture of understanding of Scripture. So here, Jesus uses a word, anedehan. And when you trace the meaning of this word, it really means shamelessness. Amen. It means, yet because of his shamelessness, he will give to him as many as he needs. So let's explore that. Let us unpack this. Why is this so important? Because first of all, we have to understand that in the Middle Eastern context, honor or shame can be very important. As a matter of fact, we, we look at this word, and shamelessness could very well then be asked if we, if we explore this. Many times we think it was the man who came at midnight that the word describes his coming and his attitude and his persistence on knocking. But nowhere do we find anyone knocking on the door. As a matter of fact, archaeologists will tell you, if you go to a Middle Eastern village or a, or a Palestinian village at the time of the writing, you didn't have to knock. Many times, the door was merely a curtain that would be hung to seal the house from the outside world. You could actually go and just whisper through the curtain. And the person inside would reply. Well, we know the man said, in reply, he says, Do not trouble me because the door is now shut. So there was a door, but even the doors at the time were not with bolts and nuts and thick wooden panels. You didn't have to wake up the whole family. And some would say that, you know, Jesus was actually using here an example of very fine humor. Because the humor is, here's the man who's put the family in bed. The homes in those days were just one big room. So mom and dad are already asleep, and all the kids are lined up. You know, they start with the youngest, and then the second youngest, or the second, and then they go to the oldest, and then mom and dad. So dad would tuck the first one in and move back, back, back towards the, the bot. And many times you have the pet goat or the lamb of the family that's sleeping with the kids. So if at midnight there's a knock on that door, the order of the house is disturbed because the goat starts bleating and the lamp is upset and the children are crying and dad has to step over everyone to try and get to the door. But we miss the point. We miss the point because the question should be asked, if this word, Anaidehan, is translated as shamelessness, who was shameless? 
the person coming, standing outside, or the person on the inside. It's very clear that they were friends. The Bible says that. But it's also very clear that he did not receive what he requested based upon their friendship. Jesus says that. He says, I tell you, though he will not rise and gift him because he is his friend. It's not the friendship that was the motivation. So what prompted this man? Well, when you look at some of the the use of this word, even as far back as the 7th century BC, you had Archilochus, and then, of course, if you come down to the 5th century, you look at Plato and Sophocles and Herodotus, and they all used the word anadehan to be translated as shamelessness. It was meant to protect the honor of a person within the community. Now, the crucial word here, if that is indeed what the word means, it means it would be shameful for God not to give what the man asks. Because if it is indeed, if it is used about the man coming to ask the bread, if you and I were in those positions where we needed somebody to come to God, does that mean that it's a shame to come to God and ask him something? That's why the word cannot be interpreted for the person coming. It can only apply to the person on the inside who has to respond to that request. Also, if the persistence is the word translated, because the people thought, well, shamelessness sounds too negative, so translators interpret it as persistence. But if the word is persistence and that word is applied to the person inside the house, that does not resonate with God's character. God is not persistent. When it comes to anything we ask. But God will only give that which is good. So we have to ask the question, how do we apply this? Well, let us look at the personal pronoun that's used here. There is a lot. It says in verse 8, look at the many times the word he is used. For I say to you, though he, talk about the person on the inside, will not rise and give to him, the person on the outside, because he, the person on the outside, is his friend, the person on the inside, yet because of his persistence. And now we don't know which one it is. Right there, it can be either one. But he will rise, obviously the one on the inside, and give him, the one on the outside, as many as he needs. So right there, the fifth personal pronoun there creates a problem. Because who is it? who is impacted by this request. So when you look at the example that we have here, at the parable itself, it is very obvious that Jesus here was trying to teach us something about a quality that is inside God when we approach God with prayer and with a need. It's obvious that the word that is translated as persistence, which should be shamelessness, does refer to the person on the inside. It's a man inside the house. Now, let us pause here for a moment. Because the Bible does share with us the way that God relates to a sinful human race. And I want to invite you to, if you have your Bible there with you, turn with me to the book of Hebrews. Come with me to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 is the hall of fame because it tells us about all the heroes of faith. Correct? It really talks about, about um, how God relates to us as people who are his 
children having faith in him. But look at Hebrews 11 and verse 16. Very important. Talking about the people with the hope of heaven in their hearts, God's people. And it says in verse 15, And truly if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they, God's people, desire a better place. That is a heavenly country. And now look at this. Therefore, God is not what? Ashamed to be called their God. For he has prepared a city for them. Paul, who we believe was the author of the book of Hebrews, makes no secret that it is God's honor to prepare a city for his people. Jesus, in John chapter 14, reminded the disciples that you should not your heart be troubled, nor be afraid, because I am going to my Father's house, because there are many mansions. I will go and prepare a place for you, and I will come again. Why would God interfere with a sinful human race? Because God looks and he sees his children with a hope in him. And God is not ashamed to be called their God. You go to Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 11. And in Hebrews 2 verse 11, the Bible says, For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he, Jesus, is not ashamed to call them brethren. But he says, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. So the Bible makes it very clear at the outset that God is not ashamed to call sinners who have found grace and who have become his children to be called their God. You know, someone made the, the, the remark one time, and he said, when you look at Matthew chapter 1 and you look at the genealogy of Jesus and look at all those characters that Matthew mentions there, Rahab, and you look at, uh, of course, she was the prostitute from Jericho, remember? And we look at Ruth the Moabite. And look at all those people with all their failures. I mean, you can read in the Bible about all the mistakes these people made. And yet, they are the ancestors of Jesus Christ when he was born into the human race. And if the person made the comment, they say, that is really the family portrait of Jesus on earth. And Jesus is not ashamed to let people know Way back in my ancestry, there was a prostitute. Way back in my ancestry, there was a Moabites. I'm not ashamed to be part of this group. So that brings us now to this text. And we, and we read where it says, because of his shamelessness, he will get up and he will give the person as much as he needs. So now we have to to explore that a bit further, let us go to the cultural background and look at what it is. Well, first of all, when you look at the Middle Eastern background, usually, and if you go to the city of Jerusalem today, you will find that if you walk through the old city of David, and we had the opportunity um, about four years ago when I was part of a class in archaeology, we spent a few weekends in Jerusalem, and you would walk on a Friday afternoon through the city of David. And because it's Friday, the Jews prepare for Shabbat. But you would always go to a, to a place, and you can see these people baking fresh bread. And it's like 20 centimeters in diameter and about 2 centimeters thick. So it's a, it's a round kind of loaf that is about that thick. And that is a typical bread that they talk about. Now, this bread is usually only available until around 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Then the ovens are turned off, and that's it. So if you don't get your bread supply in the morning, if you run out of bread later that afternoon or evening, you have to go and knock on a neighbor's door and ask, can you help me with a loaf or two? So that's the first thing. This man had no bread when a friend arrived. But secondly, what's very important is 
He did ask for how many loaves? Three. Now, it was very unusual at the time for a person to, to have three loaves of bread that you could eat. You could eat maybe one and maybe a half, but three, that's a lot of bread. So why would he bother to ask three loaves if only a visitor arrived? It's because the culture was such that you would always give your guest more than what he needs. The proof of hospitality and the proof of showing honor to your guest was to give him more than what he needed. And Jesus proved that exactly just two chapters before this. You remember what happened in Luke chapter, or was it chapter 9? Where Jesus came and he fed the 5,000. This is in Luke chapter 9 from verse 10 through to verse 17. Now, I don't want to go into the detail of the parable or the miracle of the 5,000 being fed. But what was the aftermath of that? You remember? At first, they had five loaves and two fish. Isn't that what it said? Because Jesus said, you feed them. And they said to him, Lord, we have no more than five loaves and two fish. Verse 13, unless we go and buy food for all these people. And Jesus took that five loaves and two fish and he fed 5,000 men only, excluding women and children. We don't know how many they were. But yet at the end, the Bible says the disciples went and they gathered 12 baskets of leftover bread. Now, why is this important? We say, well, it just shows how big the miracle was. No. The culture of the time was, you need to give people more than what they need because that shows that you honor them. And you protect yourself from being in shame in your community. And that is why it was not unusual for a person where you had family arriving unexpectedly, you would call on the neighbors and say, you know, I need some coffee, and, and I need some sugar, and I need this. And all the neighbors come together because the neighbors knew community had to do with your honor. They would all come together because it was a bad reflection, not only on the individual, but on the community as well, if the guest was not adequately cared for. Now we understand why Paul could make the comment, in Romans chapter 8. Verse 23. Is it Romans chapter 8 verse 23? Um, sorry. Romans chapter 8 verse 32. Paul reasons like this. He says, What shall we then say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Now look at verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us what? All things. What does this tell us about God? Well, if you were living in the Middle East at the time, you knew exactly it meant that God is willing to give you more than you need. God is willing to bless you. And by the way, this is the principle that's embedded in returning a faithful tithe to God. God says, trust me in this. You give me a tithe of your income. And you observe how God will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you cannot contain it. So when we now look at the parable of the man who came, he didn't have bread, so he came and he asked for three loaves. And it's interesting, when you read it carefully, Jesus actually said in verse 8, I tell you, Although he will not rise and give it to him because he is a friend, yet because of his shamelessness, he will rise and give him, notice what it says, not three loaves, but as many as he needs. 
the principle of God doing more than what we ever ask. Now remember, Jesus is teaching us here something about prayer. God is teaching us something about what he just said about how we ought to pray. Our Father in heaven, give us, give us this day our daily bread. Let your kingdom come. Your will be done. And it's interesting that Jesus is sharing this, this parable to exemplify and to actually expand his teaching on prayer. So what does this tell us about prayer? <laughs> well, sometimes we're hesitant to pray, aren't we? I know there are people who say, well, I don't know, you know, I, I cannot pray. Or people say, well, you know, I, will God really do this for me? And, and it's not that we don't think God, God cannot do it. It's just that why would I bother to ask God for this? Many times we rely on ourselves. We trust in our own way of dealing with problems. You know, it's, it's tragic that how many times we try every other resource in the world to try and solve our problems and satisfy our needs, and God is always the last resort. Jesus wants us to know that God must be the first resort because God is not a resource. God is the source. So if you and I come to Christ in the middle of the night, an inconvenient time, first of all, the time is not the problem yet. It's not how convenient or inconvenient it is. The parable wants to tell us something about the integrity of God when it comes to our requests. It tells us about God's response in his heart to the cry of the human heart to satisfy a need. Because Jesus wants us to know that God has put his reputation on the line when it comes to prayer. I know it sounds terrible, but think it through for a moment. When Jesus teaches them how to pray and says, pray and say, Our Father who art in heaven, do all these things for us. And now Jesus says, you know what? Your heavenly Father is willing to do more than that. Don't stay away from God. You know, we, we, can honestly, we can honestly look at this and it's like Jesus is saying, you know, not only is God's honor on the line when it comes to prayer, heaven and the honor of heaven is on the line. Because remember, the person in the parable had the community with the honor he had in the community. We talk about all of heaven here. And God as the one who we can approach. You know, it's interesting that Luke is the only gospel writer who in a sense wants to remind us here of another great miracle that happened. It also happened at night. And we go to the second chapter of Luke. And we look at the night Jesus was born. Where was Jesus born? In a place called Bethlehem. What does Bethlehem mean? Anyone? Bethlehem means house of bread. Interesting. Now look at what happened that night. And Luke describes this in detail. The only gospel writer, Matthew alludes to this, but Luke describes it in detail. Matthew describes about the wise men from the east who came, but Luke takes the time to describe the night Jesus was born. Verse 8 of Luke chapter 2. Now they were in the same country, shepherds living out in the herds, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold... An angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. 
and this will be the sign to you. You'll find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger, and suddenly was with the angel a multitude of heavenly angels praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. What is the meaning of this? It means that God gave Jesus as the bread of life into the house of bread at midnight. Just like the parable explains, one who's willing to give more than what we ever ask. And notice it says, I bring you the good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people, not only for some. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Notice God loved the world, not the things of the world. God loved everyone in the world. That includes you and me and all the sinners out there. So when we look at the parable in conclusion, what the parable tells us is God is there for us. And it's not the fact that God is my friend. You know, it is Job who said, you know, make friends with God, right? So good things can come over your life. Become a friend of God. But God says, I'm not giving you that because I'm your friend and you're my friend. No, no, no. I give it to you because of what's inside of me. It's all about what's inside of God. Why is that important? Because there are people who sometimes think, think that, you know, God is against me. God has done this to me. You know, God is really putting me through this trial and test. They don't feel like God is a friend at that time. And that's why Jesus says it's not based on friendship. Because there might be times when you don't feel that you are friends with God. There might be times we are angry with God. And if we are brutally honest with ourselves, my friends, we know there are times when we don't feel like praying. That times we want to take the Bible and throw it in God's face and say, take that promises because it means nothing to me. There are times when you accuse God of all the wrongs and all the bad things, all the evil that come over your life. And that's why God says, there are times when you may not feel like I'm your friend, so I'm not giving this to you based on the friendship. But because of my shamelessness, because my reputation and heaven's reputation and the honor of God is on the line, you can come and ask. And God is always willing to give you more. I pray that God will bless you as you come to him with whatever need you have, with whatever challenge you may face. Because this parable is a parable that tells you and it tells me the story of a God who is more than willing to answer. Amen. Does that mean God always says yes? No. Does that mean we can pray for anything we want? No, because James clearly says we sometimes pray and we ask amiss because we only pray for our selfish needs. God will not give you anything that will destroy your life or that will damage your relationship with him or that will imperil you more. Because his reputation is on the line. Say to me the first one to say, yeah, God, look what you did. That person prayed for more poison and you gave it to them. So they died because of you. No. God will only do what is good. That's why Jesus says, if your son, and this is what he explains in the next part. He says, I don't want you to just pray for anything. What if the son comes and says, Dad, I would like to have a scorpion. Dad says, sorry, son, I'd rather give you an egg. <laughs> That's a parable. God will not give us a scorpions and the snakes and the things that can harm us. God wants us to know that we can trust him with our well-being. May God bless you. As you come to him knowing that he's not ashamed to be your God. And it is God who is shamelessly willing to give you what you ask because he loves you. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for the God you are. Thank you for the shamelessness in the heart of God. You're not ashamed to call sinners who have been washed in the blood of Jesus.
who have found grace in you, your children. You're not afraid for anyone to come and ask. At sometimes the most inappropriate time for a need they have because you are always there, not because of the friendship, but because of the fact that you are God. Thank you, Jesus, that we can come to you. And Lord, I pray this morning that you look down upon the group of people sitting in this church today. You know the anxiety. You know the struggles. You know the experiences we go through. You know those things that are deep in our hearts that really bother us, that can cause pain and frustration. Lord, thank you that you also look deeper, that you know more than our hearts, that you know everything, that you also know what we need. And thank you that you are the God who will shamelessly bless us with more than we need. In Jesus' name, amen.